Hey everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hello, my name is Skylar. I'm a certified dog trainer and pet nutritionist. Today I'm going to be sharing with you five reasons why you're not meeting your training goals and how to fix that. The first reason why you might not be reaching your training goals is that you're just not using high enough value rewards. Oftentimes when I'm working with clients, on our very first class they'll bring, you know, usually a mix of kibble and cookie treats and usually the commercial training treats that you can find at the pet store. And for a lot of dogs in more challenging situations especially, that's just simply not enough. In general, if you're learning something new or working in an environment with new distractions, you're gonna want to up the value of your rewards. I often recommend things like string cheese and hot dogs, especially when we're working on new things or we're working outdoors among a lot of distractions, because those things tend to be higher value rewards that your dog is more willing to work for. Another thing to take into consideration is variety of the treats, not only in your treat pouch, but that you give your dogs kind of throughout the day. In a treat pouch, it's nice to have three to five different types of treats. That way, not only are they getting a new treat every time, which makes things much more exciting and engaging, but it also gives you a little bit of a rating system of how engaging and how high value these rewards are for your dog. For example, if you have a little bit of their kibble in your treat pouch, this is great for when you're working on very well-known cues in a familiar environment, like asking your dog to sit in the living room, but that's probably not going to do very much if you're working on heel in a distracting park environment. So having, you know, string cheese, hot dogs, uh, meat treats, freeze-dried treats, anything of a higher value is gonna help come in handy when you're in those environments. Adding this variety also helps to keep your treats from becoming boring and kind of ruining them in the long run. One of my favorite examples of this is if you give your dog Wagyu steak for every single treat, they're eventually gonna get bored of that. Even though it's a really high quality meat, it's really tasty, it's nice and juicy, if they get it every single time, your dog's gonna get pretty dang bored. So mixing up your treats, and especially taking the time to figure out what treats your dog values more so that you can create that ranking scale is gonna really, really benefit you in the future. If you find that your dog just doesn't have any interest in treats while you're training, especially in more distracting environments, definitely take a look at both your dog and the environment. Dogs that are scared, nervous, fearful, or even in pain are less likely to want to have treats or to go into environments where they feel uncomfortable. In environments where there's a lot of distractions or things going on, or again, your dog just doesn't feel safe, oftentimes even the best treat in the world is not enough to make them feel like they can comfortably eat, let alone do what's asked of them. So if you notice this with your dog, take them to the vet, see if there's any pain that can rule that out, and take them to an easier or quieter environment to see if we can regain some of that focus and engagement. That brings me to reason number two, there's just too many distractions. When we're training our dogs, we wanna make sure that we're setting them up for success. That way they're actually capable of doing what we're asking them to do. A good example of this is when you're learning something brand new, you're going to want to do it in a very distraction-free, and familiar environment. That way your dog feels as comfortable as possible in the environment, so that's not a contributing factor to them not being successful. And there's less distractions, so they're able to be more focused on what's being asked of them. As you and your dog continue to improve through training, and you're ready to start generalizing the behavior that you've already practiced pretty well in a familiar environment, you can start to slowly add more distractions. So maybe instead of working in your living room, you work in the backyard where you have birds and squirrels and smells to distract. And then once you get really, really good there, maybe the front yard or a nearby park where there's people walking by, cars, um, maybe another dog in the distance. If you find that your dog is having trouble focusing in an environment, identify what distractions may be making this more difficult and increase the distance from those distractions. If you haven't practiced working around other dogs, Throwing your dog into an environment where they're four feet away from another dog can be really, really difficult. So instead of being four feet away, maybe you're 10 feet away, or 20 feet away, or even 40 feet away, and working slowly to decrease that distance is gonna help to get your dog more and more comfortable and more and more successful working in that environment. A good analogy to help put this into perspective is if you imagine an elementary school classroom and all the kids are being asked to take a math test. If you want the kids to do well, you want a nice, quiet, low-key, calm environment that's familiar to them, and that's naturally gonna help them be able to focus on their work better. If you were to ask them to take the test in the middle of the playground at recess, they're not gonna do as well. 
And if you really just balls to the wall, throw them in the middle of Disneyland and ask them to take that test, there is no way that's going to be a successful test. So really keep this in mind while working with your dog and be sure that you're setting them up for success in environments where they can be successful. Number three, there's no consistency. One of my best recommendations to clients when we're going through our training sessions is to build the training into things you do every day. A lot of people seem to have this unrealistic expectation that in order to have a well-trained dog, you should be setting aside an hour every single day to train. And this just isn't realistic, and it's also not even the most effective way of doing things. With my clients, I usually recommend you know 10-15 minutes two or three times a day if you really want to dedicate time and energy into training. But the best way to do it is really just to train throughout the day and correlate it to routines. Dogs really like routines, they like being able to anticipate what's going to happen next. My best recommendation when it comes to training is to set up reward stations around your house. These can be mugs, mason jars, cookie jars, whatever you have around that you fill with a bunch of your training treats and put in locations of your house where you're going to be with your dog often. The more we reward desired behaviors, the more likely they are to show up. So when we're there and ready to reward all of these desired behaviors, it helps to take some of the pressure off of us in finding time in our day to create dedicated training scenarios and dedicated practice, and instead just helps us to you know, recognize when our dogs are doing things that we would like them to continue to do throughout the day and rewarding them so they can continue doing those. A few examples of this may be, you know, when you feed your dogs and you want them to instead of, as soon as you put the bowl down, going after it while your hands are still there. Maybe as a safety precaution, you want to teach them a release cue in order to eat so that way you can get away from the food. Asking them to sit and wait before putting the food down helps to create that routine of you know, before you get your food, you have to do these things, wait for this cue, and then it's all yours. Another good example is having your dog, you know, sit before you open the door just so they aren't rushing out. Creating these routines help your dog to anticipate what's going to happen next, which helps them to be more successful, which helps the training to just set in and be more functional for you. Number four, poor timing. This is probably close to the number one reason, if not the number one reason, why people are unsuccessful in reaching their training goals. Dogs have a really short window of opportunity where they correlate the things they did as the reason they got the treat. So in order to help make this nice and clear and concise is to use a reward marker. Reward markers rely on classical conditioning in order to associate the sound of the reward marker with the arrival of a treat. You may be familiar with this concept already if you're familiar with Pavlov's dog, where essentially Ivan Pavlov was researching the amount of saliva that dogs produced and found that the dogs would produce more saliva when they heard the assistant coming in with the food rather than they were first presented with the food. Pavlov took this experiment a little bit further and started to play a metronome before the arrival of the dog's food and quickly they began to drool once they heard the metronome as opposed to, again, the food actually being there. A reward marker relies on the same premise where we have conditioned a word like yes or good or the sound of a clicker to mean that a treat is coming. In a perfect scenario when training your dog and you aren't using a reward marker, you would have to stick the treat in their mouth the second they did the thing that we want. For example, if we ask our dog to sit, the second their butt hits the ground, we want to pop that treat in their mouth. For some things like sit, this is relatively possible, but definitely as we get more and more advanced and ask more and more of our training, this becomes less and less of a possibility. So using a reward marker instead to mark that exact second gives us time to fumble with our treat pouch, walk back over to our dog, whatever is delaying our reward giving process and still creates that really strong association. So for example, instead of having to stick the treat right in the dog's mouth as soon as their butt hits the ground, we can instead say yes or click our clicker as soon as the butt hits the ground, fumble with our treat pouch a little bit and get that reward. And that still has a very clear understanding that the reason they're getting the treat is because their butt hit the ground and they did what we asked. Why do I like clickers more than words like yes or good? Clickers are just a little bit more consistent. Um, they're consistent in sound. Every single time you click, it sounds pretty much the exact same. They also are a little bit faster than a vocal cue. Your reflexes when you're hitting the button of a clicker are a little bit faster than the reflexes of you know a word actually leaving your mouth. Because once your brain registers, that's the second it needs to happen, your reflexes of your thumb much faster than actually getting the words out. Last but not least, clickers don't have any emotion associated with them. They're just clear, consistent, emotionless. 
Our voices do carry some emotion and sometimes that can be really really excited and sometimes it can be really frustrated because we've been working on this for a while but you finally got it so good yes. Our dogs can pick up on that and being able to be free of that emotion really helps to avoid creating negative associations or creating learned helplessness which is basically when our dogs just kind of give up and have us try to do everything for them. And the fifth and final reason why you might not be reaching your training goals is just because you need the help of a professional. It's okay to ask for help. There's definitely some times where training can be super fun. I really love the creative problem solving aspect of my job, but asking for help is definitely totally a reasonable and beneficial thing that you should be doing. Especially as you get more and more advanced with your training or you come across a problem that you just need a little extra support on, getting the help of a reputable certified trainer can do wonders in helping your progress. It is important to keep into consideration though that the dog training industry is completely unregulated, meaning anyone who wants to make a business card that says they're a dog trainer can, and that's totally legally okay. However, they don't actually have to know anything about dog training, the way dogs learn, or the consequences of using different tools and methods. Because of this, I really recommend that you look for a certified dog trainer and one that uses positive reinforcement and force-free methods. A lot of the more traditional or old school training methodology uses a lot of aversive-based methods, which bring pain and discomfort to teach your dog to avoid punishment rather than actually teaching your dog what's expected of them and what they should do. Countless studies and scientific articles have found that these methods can really damage your dog's physical and emotional well-being in the long run. If you'd like to learn more about different tools and different methods and how that actually affects your dog on a mental level, feel free to check out all of the resources down in the description below. I have an entire page of my website dedicated to collecting all of the studies and making them super easy to find and go through for you. I hope you enjoyed my list of five reasons why you're not reaching your training goals and how to fix it. It can definitely be frustrating when you're working on something for so long and can't seem to be getting anywhere. So I hope this helped get through some of your roadblocks. If you have any other questions about dog training or would like to see more training videos in the future, please be sure to leave your questions and ideas down in the comments below. I would love to go through them and I really hope to start making more training videos in the future. If you have any thoughts or advice related to this video, please be sure that your statements are factual and supported by evidence before we leave them down there. I do try to go through the comment sections, but especially as the videos get larger and larger, I can't keep as close of an eye on all of the comment sections. But I do know these videos are a resource for a lot of people, so I want to make sure that nobody is getting any harmful or incorrect information down there. If you would like to learn more between videos, you can definitely follow me on social media. I have two Instagram accounts. I have tattoo.dogtrainer, which is more of the youtube -y side of things, as well as Top Dog Behavior, which is my training business. Um, that's gonna be a lot more training information like the video you saw today, a lot of infographics, um, a lot of fun stuff, easily shareable stuff if you have friends or family that could maybe use some help. Once again, thank you for watching today's video and I hope to see you next time. Bye.